by Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth, make us teachable. And I pray that we would worship thee in spirit and in truth. And that you would cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And I pray that we would walk humbly before thee in meekness and in the fear of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that not our will, Father, but thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, I ask you, please give us discernment during these times, Lord, during all this deception, all these lies, all these, all this fraud that is taking place, Lord, please give us discernment. And give us ears to hear thy voice. And Lord, whatever thou would have us to do, Lord, make us willing to do it in the day of thy power. In Jesus Christ, name our God and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Robert is back with us tonight. We're, we're plodding through the fifth chapter of Matthew, and uh, I think we're ready for the 40th verse. And so, why don't you just go through verse 45, and we'll stop, and we'll both reflect on that, and then maybe I can, we'll, we'll kind of just see where we're at at that point. How's that? So I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Sounds good, brother. I just got to say first, you know, I mean, man, there's so much this chapter, and, you know, and there, it just shows, you know, it, and this is, you know, this is the Lord's. You know, this is really, you know, I believe when, when Deuteronomy it talks about how you know, Moses is talking to the people and he says, uh, the Lord will raise up, uh, you know, a prophet like unto me amongst, amongst you, you know, amongst you people and him you eat shall hearken. And, um, if anyone will not listen to him, you know, the Lord will require it of him. It, you know, it, it, basically I understand that as Moses is saying, there's going to be someone coming like, like unto me. But when he comes, he's also going to be bringing a law. And his law is going to be above my law, every every law. And I believe this is what we're reading here in, in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, there's things in this, in this law that I know that I'm guilty of not following through with. And there's also things that I don't understand how to you know, teach to others or, or, you know, to, I, I don't want to lean on my own understanding in, in these. And I think that a lot of it has to do with my own ignorance, just with the customs of those days, the traditions of those days, the Jewish ceremonies, the, the, you know, um, you know, not, not that we are to go to the Jews for counsel or, or for wisdom or understanding because they reject the Messiah, but I do believe that there is wisdom in, you know, learning about the customs that they were, that they were, you know, living in 2,000 years ago. And I think just that alone, the Jewish customs and the Jewish traditions would help us to understand this a little bit more. And I'm, and I have not done that. But with that being said, it's, uh, verse, verse 40. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not, a, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Well, you know, <laughs> I'll make a few comments and then turn it back to you on those on those five verses. Uh, we talked about this last time about. If any man sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. You know, um, that's a very, especially during today's um, what's going on with civil law and everything. Yeah. It's really, really hard <clears throat> to follow that. You know, especially like I said, being a property owner and renting properties and so on it's really hard um but god's been really working 
on me on that. And, you know, it's all in the, you know, it's like the old saying, there's the uh, the letter of the law, <laughs> and then there's the the actual, you know, the moral code is one thing, but the spirit of the law is something else, you know. And our spirit, you know, it's a scripture that says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And I, I think that's speaking to... Uh, you know, in other words, there there is, in Romans 1, it talks about that men are without excuse, you know. They've been given, it says that they can look at, they can look at creation, they can look at creation and see the Godhead. Right. And uh, when you think about the Trinitarian nature, of man, the fact that he has a mind, a soul, and the spirit. And so, man has been left without excuse. I mean, he, he is without excuse before God. But the, the, but this is what I think this is talking about, this whole thing about our relationship to our enemies, you know. Oftentimes, I think we define our enemies as, you know, it's a, you know, usually we define our enemies as people that we don't like or people that don't like us. Well, right. why why don't we like someone or why don't they like us? It's not because necessarily the color of tie that I have on, you know. Right. Usually, you know, and, you know, you can look up. You can look up the definition of enemy, and you know you can kind of get your boat loaded on that because a person who who you're opposed to, or a person who's opposed to you, or is hostile to you, um, usually there's there's a reason behind this hostility. Right. You know, uh, it may be that they are just totally. Um, philosophically in opposition to, to your your culture, what you believe, or, or your religion, or whatever it might be. Uh, but if they're antag if we're antagonistic, um, oftentimes we look at it from a military standpoint, like you know one country being uh, an enemy of another country, and we see that going on right now too. Um, right. But what what is it that brings us to conclusion that someone is our enemy. Uh, and I think if we really come to grips with that, um, you know, we can't, we can't change anyone's heart. You know, and, and we can, we can try to use all of the huh, finesse, uh, you know, every social means, um, we can try to win them over to our cause and do all these things. But if God... That's is, what, yeah, go ahead. And, and that's what the, the, you know, the modern church, I think, is doing. Because right. they don't, they, they no longer believe that there's power in this word. You know, scripture says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's right. And that's where the power is. Right. You know, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes it. And in like just like you're saying, um, you know, like Hillsong, you know, they have Hillsong is like, you know, Hillsong United. Right. I mean you know, there's been a couple of songs that they sung that I've but man, they're you know, they, they have a little bit of scripture in there and, and they I enjoy listening to it. But there's just, there's no, there's no power. There's emotion, but right. there's no power. And, you know, it makes you think about how many people are truly born again in that congregation. Well, and now because Hillsong has embraced the homosexual lifestyle. Right, because because they've departed from this book. Right. Right, and, and even that with the modern versions, you know, that, you know, 
Satan works through subtlety. And you cannot have gotten the message translation, which is what Rick Warren loves to use in his Chris Blom, um heretical church. You could not get the message translation in the in the late 1800s. Right. Because it would be way too obvious that, wait, this isn't the word of God. You know, it's done through subtlety. The RSV has to be introduced first, which looks and sounds just like the, you know, the King James. And then the American Standard, and then the NIV, and then the ESV. And so you see the subtlety. You know, and that's what we're seeing today, the subtlety of, of this tyranny taking place. You know, the serpent is the, the most subtle of all beasts of the field. Right. Well, you know, it's it's quite interesting to me to contemplate um, because the Ferris, you know, well, several different conversations occurred with Christ. You know, they asked Christ, you know, who is my brother? Okay. Yeah. Who is my brother? Uh, who is my neighbor? Well, the question. Trying to justify themselves. Right. And the question that I'm asking is, who is my enemy? Because, you know, it, it, the scripture says that if a person is, um, an enemy, there does seem to be, in other words, if someone is attacking God, okay, and his cause, then I think we have we have every right to be in righteously indignant over that. In other words, because it says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And it says the Lord will hold them all in derision. Okay? Sure. And so, but I have to remind myself constantly that there are different rules for me <laughs> Then God has, you know, in other words, God can proclaim anything he wants to, but he sets certain rules for his creation and for his elect that are different than for himself. Right. And uh, right. and so this issue of, of loving your enemy, um, bless them that curse you, you know, that's, Amazing. I mean, that is really amazing. Bless them that curse you. Do good, do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, you know. And so you make, you raise a good point regarding, you know, we, we are to pray for our rulers and those who, who are, you know, uh, in, in rulership positions and we are not to uh, we're we're to honor the king what right. we're told to do honor the king that's right and so i haven't always done that uh, i've been convicted of as of late about it you know that doesn't mean i uh, that doesn't mean i endorse the king that doesn't mean i endorse what they're doing that doesn't mean that i don't stand against their lies and their evil doings. But that being said, when it says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, and it says, uh, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And it says, um, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. Now, we know the, the how that that has been uh, falsely interpreted because we have to start with uh, everything comes under the the higher power which is God himself but at the same time I think that that's uh, what that's referring to as it relates to honoring and showing respect I don't think we should disrespect or dishonor uh, those in authority over us and um I have been guilty of that in the past, I must say, and I've had to repent of it. Um, and then verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. I've talked about that before, 
that's a pet passage of scripture for those who are touting common grace. And that is not what this is referring to when it says that he he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. That just means that the sun shines <laughs> on all of his creation. And also it means that it, it, the rain, it rains on all of his creation. It doesn't mean that all men without exception are recipients of common grace because grace is not common. And if you do a study on common grace, it, you know where it, <laughs> you end up with? You end up in natural law. Natural law, you know. And that's quite a study, and that's why I get into the study on the on the documents. But, you know, there's no such thing as common grace. You know, there's no such thing as a universal offer of the gospel. There's no such thing as a well-meant offer. You know, there's a lot of people that use that term. I mean, <clears throat> Alistair Bagg uses it all the time. Well-meant offer. It's not an offer. <laughs> okay. It's a decree. When When Christ says, uh, or you know, it, even his apostles, when they say, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved," that's a decree. It's not an offer. All of those who believe on him are his, and that's the only ones that will believe on him. Uh, and so, whenever you start taking the position that you know. God makes an offer, he throws an offer out there, and it's well meant to anyone who will receive it. <laughs> well, that's not an offer. Right. The, the people who receive it are the ones who've been given the gift of God's grace. Right. You know, and so the other piece is, is that uh, there is there is an aspect of why why does God show uh his goodness to anyone is the question. Why does he show his mercy to anyone? Why does he show his grace to anyone? Um the only answer it can be is because it was in his it was in his um perfect will to do so. I mean, if if it wasn't his will to show goodness to some and not others, and how many times have we heard when we quote the scripture here that he reigns on the just and the unjust and so forth, you know, and his son to rise on the evil and on the good. Um, how many times do people couple that with... Uh, talking about the fact that God has is you know he he's he's good all the time Bill Gaither wrote a book uh, wrote a song and that's the name of the song God is good all the time God isn't good all the time you know and, and God isn't even good all now I want to be careful the way I say this, but it, it, I guess you'd have to get into semantics about what is good. Now, for for his elect, it's true. It says that he works all things, you know, to their good, to those who love him. All things work together for good. All things work together for good to them that love him and, and those who are called according to his purpose, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that they're, everything is good just because it's working to our good, right? Sure. And so, anyway, that's I've spent some time on this, but I just wanted to make sure that people understand that God is a God of justice. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. He even chastens his own people. Okay? And chastening is good for us. Okay. Uh, remember, Enjoy it for all we're receiving, but afterward it yields the peaceable fruit. Right. Yeah. Remember when you, you, you now I know probably 
you know, we're living in a different time frame anymore, Robert, but when we were coming up, and I'm sure that even would would include you, but remember when we got a whipping, your dad would say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going right. to hurt you. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, right. You know, but uh, that's uh, – anyway, so – I'm going to turn it back. I'm going to turn it back over to you to kind of cover these uh, five verses. I heard Brother Mahan say one time, uh, you know, he was saying his understanding of this. You know, I don't, I don't want to misquote. I'm not going to quote him exactly. I don't remember exactly how he said it, but he said you know, somewhere along the lines of, you know, when you got a farmer that's a believer, you know, the, the Lord will cause rain to rain on that farmer's crop. But the farmer that's next door, and this is a, I take on a whole other meaning being out in rural Texas right. now, you know, instead of California. But um, when you've got a farmer across the street, you know, next door neighbor, that, that wants nothing to do with the Lord, never once gave him thanks for anything. But yet he has a roof over his head, maybe has a couple of children, has a beautiful wife, you know, has been married for a long time, whatever. You know, that's all the blessing of the Lord. Even though this this, this unbeliever has never once acknowledged or given thanks for these things. The, the, the very breath that's in his lungs, you know, comes from the very Lord who he convinces himself is not even, you know, existent. But yet, he causes the rain to rain on his, on his, one of his elect, but the unbeliever also gets to receive, right. he gets to partake in the blessing, and you know, maybe he's over there, you know, maybe he's, doing some kind of witchcraft or, you know, water witching or something, you know, and thinking that, oh, well, that's why the, the rate, you know, and it's just that's the foolishness of, of us as, you know, fallen human creatures. But, um, you know, and I thought that that was a pretty good, you know, understanding of, of what, it, you know, of, you know, how, because cause God is good you know, and, and God is love. And the, the fact Part of the fact I think that God is love is the fact that He, he does that. He, he, he bless you know any any man that has a full functioning mind, a full you know two hands, two arms, two legs, you know just you 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 know it, you know because obviously there's there's people in this world that are that are they're all different types, they're all different sizes, they're all different. But if you if the Lord has given you a body that allows you to be able to you know do hard work or just, you know, I mean, just live your daily life. That is a blessing from the Lord that you did not deserve. And there's, you know, millions, if not billions of people that have lived this life that have never once given the Lord thanks for those things. Right. And because they just take it for granted that, oh, well, you know, I had something to do with being born on this date and this time, however many years ago, thinking that they were the ones that, that created themselves. And that's, that's just the arrogancy of man. And, you know, um, we, you know, we, we get upset when we, we, when we hold the door open for somebody at the gas station and they don't acknowledge us, they don't give thanks, they just walk right on by, you know, and, and you're like, well, you're not going to say thank you or anything, you know, but the Lord does that for everybody, you know, and without ever being acknowledged, without ever, you know, and, and we are to do the same to others because that's how the Lord is to us. Even, you know, while we are still in our sins, while we are still, you know, uh, in the world, he was doing that to us. You know, there's many times when I believe that the Lord spared me by his grace and his mercy. You know, I should have taken, I should have been taken out of this world a long time ago, many, many times over because of my foolishness. You know, when I was in the flesh in the world and it's only by the grace of God, you know, protecting me and loving me when I didn't even know who he was, you know, and. Oh, go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, uh, I would encourage our listeners, if you get a chance, sometime do a uh, word study on evil in the Bible. It, it'll it'll really be very enlightening to you. And just I want to point out a couple things, and I'll turn it back to you. One is uh, we've talked about this a lot, uh, Proverbs 16, 4, you know, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. And... Um, it seems like there is, you know, there are many, now I want to be careful the way I say that, there are many apparent contradictions in the Bible, but they're not contradictions at all once you start comparing Scripture with Scripture. Sure. 
for an example, uh, a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people do messages on <laughs> Ezekiel 33:11. you know, saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil way, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Now, what is the most what is the most interesting thing about this passage to me? The last uh, four words, O house of Israel. Okay, it's speaking there to the house of Israel. It's not speaking to all men without exception. And then also. In Proverbs 24:19, it says, "Fret not thyself because of evil men; neither be thou envious at the, at the wicked." Um, and in Proverbs 24:20, 20, it says, "There shall be no reward to the evil man; the candle of the wicked shall be put out." You know. And then Job, he says that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, destruction, for they shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. And so. When we talk about this whole aspect of uh, how, um, you know, and, and I agree with you, there, there seems to be um, a distinction between, in other words, let me just, Psalm 26, 5, it says, I've hated the congregation of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. So, see, there's a distinction there between who we actually fellowship with Okay. In other words, we don't go, we don't sit down and fellowship with people that are liar, you know, that are currently involved in stealing and murdering and extortion and so on. And so, anyway, I just wanted to, I'll, I'll, th- I'll throw it back to you, brother. Uh, you know, on a, Romans 12 comes up, you know, because so that we're sure that the Lord is saying what he's saying, there's going to be another example in scripture or another scripture right. uh, that's going to be giving more light on the seemingly kind of vague, you know, well, this can mean this, this can mean this, right. this can mean, you know, and, and so um, that's the beauty of God's word. And I mean, I, I, I can guarantee you that any question that is ever asked about the Lord's word, you can have a chapter and verse answer. We, the may, you know, it may not, the Lord may not choose to reveal it to me, you know, because there's been times when I'm, hey, let me get back to you on that. I don't want to give you a I think answer because right. anybody can do that. Right. You know, the power is, well, you know, John chapter 3, verse you know, 2 says this, right? That's the power. That's right. the power. That's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. In, uh, in Romans 12, you know, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we got Paul saying, let love be without, in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same one toward another. Mind not hiding, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things, because that's the, that's the easy thing to do, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he did that to me, so therefore I'm going to do the same thing to him. Right. It takes a stronger man to be able to recompense no man evil for evil. You know, that's ultimately what we're reading about. It's, it's hard. It's hard to follow the law of God. It's hard to follow, you know, the Lord, because look what he's telling you. He's telling you that something is exactly contrary to the flesh and what the flesh desires to do, what the world does. Desires and what, not not what they desire, but what they do. Right. Um, you know, I ask anybody at the job, say, "Hey, well, if this happens to you, what are you going to do?" They're immediately going to contradict what Jesus says because that is they're in the flesh, right. they're the natural. That's who we are in and of ourselves in our fallen, you know, in our fallen nature that we that we received from Adam. 
rejoice with them that you we rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no, to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. See, we're not allowed to take wrath or vengeance on our on our enemies, but the Lord does. Right, that's right. Because we're not perfect, right? He is. He, you know, it's like the Puritan said, uh, I think it was the Puritan that, that once said, he said, we must not think the Lord does something because it's uh, good good and right, but rather the thing is good and right because the Lord does it. Right, that's right. Oh, and that's, that's, that's very true. Uh, it's wrong for us to avenge, but the Lord is, it's never wrong for the Lord to exact vengeance. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And that's when, like, all this deception, lies, and fraud that's taking place today. You know, we just always have to remember that their day is coming. If they don't repent, you know, which they're not, you know, salvation is, I mean, Apostle Paul, you know, he was a murderer of God's people, and yet the Lord, he was a, he was a chosen vessel, right, right from, the, from the foundation of the world. And so there's not one man, whether it's Biden, whether it's Putin, whether it's, uh, you know, you know, uh, I mean, the Lord knows who the reprobate are, right. you know, but... Right. It goes back to we are to pray for our enemies. You know, Stephen was about to be stoned. He was about to be killed, murdered. And yet he's praying for the very one. Well, actually, I believe he's praying. I don't, I don't, I don't believe he's praying for anyone specifically, but the reason why I do believe, and this is what I'm like, I'm saying, like, we are to pray for our enemies. But even when Stephen prays for his enemy, Apostle Paul was amongst those that that Stephen prayed for, and yet Stephen was, or I mean, uh, Apostle Paul was predestinated unto adoption as a, as a son That's right. to obtain salvation. That's right. You know, and so it's like people don't, it, it, you know, I mean, and I'm guilty of it too. Like, well, how do we reconcile this? You know, it's like we are to pray for our enemies, we are to pray the Lord save them, but then the the ones that we're praying for, the Lord already predestinated them to obtain salvation. But this is we we pray for them because we're commanded to pray. Right, but yet right. the Lord already knows what we need before we pray. Right. So what's the point of praying? Because we're commanded to. That's right. You know, well, and you it know, increases I mean, our faith. Yeah, and also, you know, when we talk about uh, prayer, um, like you said, we're it's or it's um, prayer is ordained by God, and sure. like, like I've said many times, you know. How many times have you gone into someone's house and they'll have a plaque up that says prayer changes things, you know? And, you know, prayer does more to change our hearts than anything else. And, and prayer, you know, when Christ said, taught us to pray saying, you know, what did he say? Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come as on earth as it is in heaven, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors lead us not into temptation deliver us from evil and so that's a real example of prayer uh and and its purposes and i've noticed often when you pray you pray that part of that lord's prayer you know uh i i remember um a few years ago well a number of years ago now uh, I found myself being somewhat repetition, repetitious in my prayer. I often found myself saying, uh, draw us closer to thee. Okay. Um, and, and I still pray that today because, um, the only way we can become closer to him is if he draws us closer to him. You know, it's like the very end verse here, it says, which I, be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, you know. And I've, I've often read that. How in the world can he tell us to be perfect, you know? The only perfect 
Son of God, and, and the only perfection we have is in the imputed righteousness of Christ and so on. But yet, um, he does, he does, in other words, we sh- and, and that, uh, you know, in some in some circles, I would get in big trouble saying that we are to strive for perfection. I mean, sure. in other words, we are we are we are to, and how do we do that? How do we strive for perfection? We do it by by staying in His Word. Uh, by He says, pray without ceasing. You know, uh, right. and so there's a lot of exhortations that we're given. Um, that a lot of people don't uh, want to talk about, you know. Um, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Absolutely, absolutely. Abstain from fornication. You uh, know, anyone that says, I've asked, and I'm not, I'm not in any way condoning any any of the things that Paul says to abstain from, <laughs> because he's saying abstain from it. Okay. Uh, but my question is to those who say they never sin, if they never sin, why does Paul spend so much time exhorting people not to do certain things? Right. If they're if they were you know, in other words, if they were sinlessly perfect. So um but this whole And like David like David says too, you know, keep me back from presumptuous sin. Right. You know, sin. You know, I mean, sin that you're just not even aware that you're committing, but yet you're you're convinced that oh well, no, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I haven't I haven't sinned today. And it's like you're sin. You know, you're sinning by lying to yourself. That's you know? right. But uh, and, right. and just to piggyback on what you're saying, you know, in Second Timothy three sixteen, he says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for rec- for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So when Christ tells us, He commands us to be perfect. He gave us His word, and it, it's His word that you know. There's a reason why this world, our flesh, is trying to do everything that it can to keep us from reading this book. Right. Because this, this book, you know, man cannot live on bread alone by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This book is what exhorts us. It it teaches us. It cleanses us. It, it humbles us. It chastens us. Uh, you know, it's it, it, it's conforming us to the image of uh, of Christ. And and in um, James, I think it's James four. Jesus. Yeah, so in James chapter 3, actually, James 3, he says in verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in words, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So, you know, any man offend yeah, not in words. The this this perfect. whole aspect of, you know, sin, you know, we have. <laughs> We were born and conceived in sin, and the fact is, we've been born again by the Spirit of God, uh, but we still struggle against sin. And right. if you do, a, again, I like to do word studies. Right. If you do a word study on sin, you'll find 13 pages of, in the Bible on sin. You know, right. 394 times I think it's mentioned in the Bible, and. And it's it's predom it's very very it's mentioned many many times in the New Testament. And right. one of the things that he says is in First John five seventeen, all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness right. is sin. Anything that is not in total alignment 
with the law of God is sin. Anyone, that, anything that comes against his perfect law says a, a, that his law is perfect converting the soul. Yeah. And um, he says here that whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. And he says that knowing this, that the, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. He says, let not sin have dominion over you. And so uh, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And so, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Uh. Um, for he that is dead is freed from sin. That means dead to the law, right? <laughs> so, uh, and so the thing about this, this whole thing about perfection, he says in Romans seven fourteen, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And so what is, you know, what is the remedy for all of this evil and sin in the world? The remedy, you know, we go, we go back and point to the only perfect, uh, Amen. perfect Jesus sacrifice, Christ. Jesus Christ. That's right. He is our He is our only, our only perfection. You know, and and that's one of the reasons that I really here uh, oh, a couple years ago. I don't know if you were on the conference call at that time or not. You may have been. But um, we went through the whole, the fellowship. We went through the whole book of Hebrews, and you know, oh, it, it, that book of Hebrews is phenomenal because the whole thing yeah. is, is on the perfect atonement of Jesus Christ, His perfect sacrifice, and yeah. you know, so many people um, forget what Christ actually did accomplish. By freely laying his life down, okay, and you don't hear you don't hear as many sermons today about uh, the blood of Christ right. and and its efficacy and the fact that you know I, I remember I used to listen to gospel songs and they would talk about God's Jesus' blood being spilled, you know. There wasn't one drop of blood wasted. It was sh- right. it was shed for the remission of sins, and it was he shed for his people. Yeah. And so, anyway, that's what we're really wanting to make sure that we always point to that one perfect one. Right. He is our only hope. You know, I never can ever repeat it enough. You know, his yeah. his oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Yeah. When he shall come That's with right. the trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless yeah. to stand before his throne. You know. I was, I remember I was listening to, uh, you might have heard this one before, but, uh, Brother Mahan was was preaching one time, and he said, "I think he was at the Grand Canyon, and or was it Ralph Barner? Barner. I think he was talking about Ralph Barner. Yeah. Uh, he said that he he was at the Grand Canyon or something like you know this. this he was just in awe of God's cre- you know he was admiring God's creation and uh, you know the Grand Canyon. I don't know if you ever been there, but man, I've been there before, and it makes you feel this small. That's right." Right. It's amazing, but uh, you know, but but he 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 went there and he was like, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and I'm like, someone 
tapped him on his shoulder. He's like, he's like, hey, preacher, can, can we join you on the next verse? <laughs> and so, you know, some of us listening to him, you know, another brother and sister in Christ. And, and um, but, you know, I don't hear songs like that anymore. That's you know, right. I love that song. I do, too. You know? I do, too. Uh, uh, the yeah. lyrics are just rich. That's you know, right. Rich, full of truth. So many of the old hymns are, you know, I mean, uh, I love Top Lady. Anything that Top Lady does, I love yeah. Top Lady, you know. I like John Newton, you know. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I mean, you know, Rock of Ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me sure. Rock of Ages cleft for me. And, um, yeah, there is something about when you get in God's creation. You know, I had a similar experience up in Colorado at Royal Gorge. You know, standing there looking down over the Royal Gorge, and it's like, man, it's just awesome, you know. Yeah. And my son, uh, when he was, uh, we homeschooled uh, Mark from eighth grade through high school, and he played the trumpet, and he played the trumpet at his graduation ceremony. And he chose the song that he played, and he still loves the song today. This is my father's world, you know. And um, it's a it's a phenomenal song that exalts God's creation. And we cannot. There is something about God's creation that is linked inseparably to His redemption. Sure. You know, because Scripture talks about that the whole earth is in travail. Right now, it's in travail. Sure. And then he says that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen. And we've, we're we not dwelling in that right now. I mean, right. look around us, you know. So, well, man, I think we've come to a a really good point. I mean, we've kind of worked through this chapter and... uh now, we'll be ready to start in the sixth chapter next week. Is there any final thoughts you have uh, on this fifth chapter, uh, Robert? Uh, no, just, you know, that, that the Lord would give us the grace and the faith to walk in it. Right. You know, to be doers of his word and not hearers only. Right. And, um, you know, and you know, like he says, you know, Strive to walk as he walked. You know, and, um, you know, and by his grace we will. Amen. And only by his grace. So, that's right. That's Amen. right. And, uh, you know, the um, Robert and I were talking a little bit before the Bible study about, you know, What's going on right now in the news, you know? I used to be accused of being a newspaper eschatologist, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because I would look at the news and I'd say, wow, look at this. Look at what's going on in our world, right. you know? I mean, and today, I mean, here we have our our base being attacked in the Iraq, and all this stuff going on, but, you know, I used to watch whenever uh, we don't have a television now, but we did. I used to have a television. We got rid of it uh, back when I was about 37. We threw it out in the trash, but uh, right. but they used to have an advertisement on there, and it was of a I think it was for Holiday Inn, and it would show another motel that was dirty, filthy. And the person would get ready to go in the room. They'd open the door and they'd say, surprise! <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I often think about that as a, God, God can never be taken by surprise. You know, there's a lot of people that think that, you know, that this, 
this is a war playing out between God and the devil, and everybody's wringing their hands to see who's going to win in the final front. You know, final, <laughs> God's already won. Amen. You know, he's he's seated. He won right for, for the foundation of the world. That's right. And right now he's seated at the right hand of God. He is Amen. a king right now. He's seated on his Amen. throne. And he's right. not coming back. He's not coming back wringing his hands. He's coming back as a victor. You know? Right, as a judge with fire in his eyes. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Amen. Too. Well, anyway, brother, you it's still great. Come, Lord Jesus. That's all I can say. Amen. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you, if, if not in our fellowship on Wednesday night, which I always look forward to seeing you there. But um, we'll see you. Be ready for chapter six next Saturday, brother. And I hope, right, brother, I hope you have a blessed evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.